What's up marketers, it's Liza from Xgrowth here to wish you a happy holiday season. We'll be back in the new year with more amazing guests, but for now we'll be rebroadcasting some of our favourite episodes. So grab a drink, get comfy and enjoy the show. Hello everyone, welcome to another episode. I'm Shaheen Hoda with Xgrowth and today I'm talking to Stephanie McCready. Director of Account-Based Marketing, Strategic Accounts, and Customer Marketing at Salesforce about how she approaches ABM at Salesforce, how she and her team divide their attention among companies' strategic accounts, and what are some of the go-to strategies that she has when it comes to dealing and engaging the sales team in the, in the work that she does. On that note, let's dive in. Stephanie, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah, absolute pleasure. I'm, I'm really excited to talk about this, and uh, I think there are you know, that 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 experience that you bring from Salesforce and the work that you've done also at, at, at IBM in the past, it's it's like a lot of golden nuggets, a lot of insights. So I'm I'm super excited to talk about it. And I think where I want to start is if you could give us a high level view of what does ABM at Salesforce look like? What can if you could paint us a picture about that, that would be I think that would be a great starting point. Yeah, sure. So um, account-based marketing at Salesforce is we have a mix of one-to-one, one-to-few and one-to-many programs across several markets, actually. So we've got account-based marketing in the US. We've got it in Europe, including Scandinavia. I learned from my friends in the Nordics. Um, We've also got it in the UK and then here in Australia and New Zealand as well. And each of the programs or, or the different markets had been approaching things in different ways over the last few years. But this year, really thrilled to have a centre of excellence startup for account-based marketing at Salesforce at a global level and really bring some consistency and some best practices as well as you know, new technologies, et cetera, into, into what we're doing in each of the markets. Yeah, that's really interesting. Centre of excellence. And people are like, why do you need that? Because I feel like in a lot of other areas of marketing, you know, it might be might be directly influenced by headquarter and you would have, you know, like even with programmatic ABM, there's a lot of stuff that happens HQ and it's, it's a lot easier to communicate, hey, this is how we do things where ABM comes a lot more specific. You know, what what was it for you that or, or the team at Salesforce that kind of felt the need of bringing everything together? Look, well, first of all, I think consistency in our approach, a community, we're all about, you know, having a community and learning from each other. So what I've really valued is, yeah, that consistency, the community, the best practice sharing, but also, especially as we've got gone into with COVID, having more of a digital approach. There's so many different technologies that we ourselves have at Salesforce, but also other technologies that we can leverage that our centre of excellence is now also sort of looking into the latest and greatest technologies we can use, how we roll them out. But one of the key areas that I think most ABM professionals really are challenged with in their first year or few years of doing account-based marketing is around measurements, actually. And we found across the globe that ABM needs to be measured in different ways. And we know ITSMA and we follow that methodology of the three R's. But really, traditional marketing has often been measured more on MQLs and pipeline generated and helping progress and close deals. But for account-based marketing, we wanted to bring in those relationship and reputational measures. How are we going to measure that consistently across the globe and easily? And so I'm thrilled that now I can use a dashboard that uses Einstein Analytics and Tableau CRM to visualize for me how my program's performing, but also I can see how the ABM programs are performing across the globe in a consistent way and have that consistent dialogue and discussion with stakeholders, both in marketing and in sales. That sounds so hot for a, for an ABM nerd like me. I'm like that sounds amazing, and and you're right. Measurement is is a is a really hard hard thing. But I, I'd like to maybe dig a little bit deeper in terms of the the mix of accounts. I know you're responsible for the strategic accounts at Salesforce in uh, in in the region. Can you give us a little bit of understanding in terms of what does the mix of accounts look like that that you kind of manage? 
Yeah, sure. So in account-based marketing here in ANZ, this is our third year. We're going into our third year of account-based marketing. And in the last, for this financial year, we have decided to align 100% to the strategic accounts that our business has selected in Australia, New Zealand. And it wasn't necessarily something that was a definite. When we looked at the rigor that was going into selecting the top accounts for our pursuits in the sales environment, I found that they were some of the same criteria that we would want for account-based marketing. So so we've aligned 100% to that strategic account set. And those accounts come from a mix of industries. So there's nine different industries that those accounts, you know, span across. Some of them, some of the accounts are absolute advocates and trailblazers and have been working with Salesforce for a number of years across a number of solution areas in a number of their business units. And then there's others that might have just started their journey with Salesforce. And there are also a number of accounts that are what we would call greenfield, beginning on their journey, you know, that we would we would see that there is opportunity for them to consider Salesforce because of the industry they're in, the challenges that they're faced with, and that we might already have references and success with, with other similar accounts of their um of their industry. Right, right. So, so it's so there is a lot of. It sounds like a lot of one to ones. That uh, are there like a lot of when you say strategic, are we talking all one to one, or there are some one to few? Yeah, what, no, we have a like? yeah. Good question. We have a handful of one to ones, and the majority of the strategic accounts are in the one to few model, and that was really purposeful because we. You know, we really look at ABM from a purist model when it's one-to-one and really want to be able to go deep. And so to do so, we want to make sure that we've got the right resources aligned to those accounts. So, you know, we only have one person aligned to just very few accounts. So they can go deep on each of those in a one-to-one model. In one-to-few, one person can manage a lot more than that. And especially with when we engage our agency. So, so yeah, we have a handful of one-to-ones, but the majority are actually one-to-few. I love that. I love that that you say that because, you know, I feel like a lot of, even some of the companies that we work with and might be new to ABM, they're like, okay, we're going to start ABM and we have this this batch of companies and we will need to do one-to-one with them. And you're like, do you, I don't think you grasp the amount of work that is going to go into, into a one, one-to-one campaign. It's really cool to, to hear Salesforce as well. At, at Salesforce, you have just a handful that go into one-to-one. Like you got to be very special to, uh, to go into, uh, into one-to-one. How did, you, how did you go about deciding Mm-hmm. what goes where you know how because there are a lot of people involved right sales is like yeah everybody one-to-one all of them give them exactly. as much attention <laughs> how, how did you make that call of uh of what what goes where which, which tier we're going to pick for which account how, how did that work yeah it was actually quite scientific and at Salesforce, I'd seen some of the country teams like the UK had been doing account-based marketing a bit longer and had been working with ITSMA for a while. And so they actually had a scoring criteria that I sort of picked up and looked at and went, you know what, a lot of this is pretty similar. And in our first year, I almost used that 100%. But going into the second year, which is the year we're in now, you know, just finishing now, when we were choosing the accounts then, I actually looked at there are a couple of accounts that we didn't go so well with in in the previous year that had been selected in one to one and i looked at why that was and i then changed our weighting criteria so some of the criteria i can i can share with you you know industry attractiveness is this an industry that's growing especially in the current times that changed from our year 1 to year 2 because of covid is this customer ready to transform? Are they an innovator in their industry? What's our total addressable market for Salesforce in that industry or with that customer? So it could be one thing to have this really great in, you know, customer that is a well-known brand in Australia, is spending lots of money on IT, but are they spending it on the solutions that Salesforce have to offer? The maturity and engagement of the account team was important. And when I was first starting to work with some of these account teams, I actually went to my marketing colleagues and said, especially our exec engagement programs, how well does this account director actually work with you? What's the account team's you know, responsiveness? And so, yeah, it's using that those sorts of criteria and a scoring model to really try and take some of the bias out and just to, to double check ourselves. Yeah, I love when you, when you say that. I, I would imagine that was a very interesting meeting 
And it's fascinating when you bring that data on the table and it's not about opinions as much. And also you have the people who have the opinions there as well. And then you go through the process and they're like, all right, I guess, I guess the account that I thought would be great is not going to go in there. And, and they're okay with that. It's, it's amazing to, uh, to have that buy-in. Yeah, and the wonderful thing was is that one of the accounts that came out quite early is actually a complete Greenfield account and we discussed, you know, why it is that it would be right for this type of approach. And also because we were in year two of that account selection, they had experienced what had worked and they had seen what had worked in account-based marketing and they'd heard from their sales teams as to what was working. So they certainly got an appreciation that the account we're selecting for account-based marketing doesn't mean that there's not some great sales opportunities happening right now for those accounts or, you know, the ones they're really pursuing in sales may not be the ones that we're looking at for account-based marketing over a two to three year period. So they really had an appreciation between the selection of an account for account-based marketing versus an account for a sales pursuit. Got it. And, you know, I want to touch on this, that you talked about the the length, two, two, three years hard to convince for a marketer to go and say, you know, I'm dumb designing a campaign that is going to pay off in two years time. And the CEO is like, get out of my office. How, how did you, you know, is, are there any examples either, you know, from, from maybe Salesforce or in the past from IBM that you could think of that you really had to work for a long period of time on that, on that account? in order to uh, kind of uh, open those doors and, and make it happen? Absolutely. So I might actually give an example that is prior to Salesforce. When I was at IBM and I was launching account-based marketing for the first time on a large bank, I was actually approached to take on this role. And when I was being interviewed by the vice president on the account, he was like, do you really want to do this? You know that right now we don't have the best reputation. In fact, the board and CEO don't want to hear our name. And we've got we've got to turn this around. We're in the second year of a five year contract, and in three years' time, we'll want to renew this. Like this is one of IBM, you know, Asia Pacific's biggest customers, and we were a bit on the nose, so to say. So that was a three year program where it was winning the hearts and minds, and probably the wallets, I guess, of of that particular account. And so there's a whole mix of activity that you're doing, but. I get your point on how some of our business areas and business leaders are used to and want to see that immediate return. I still, there is still so much that needs to be invested in account-based marketing in the first few months around discovery and insights, because that is the basis for everything to do with personalization. So you still need to have that time and you need to be educating your stakeholders about account-based marketing. The first year, I would say half my time was explaining what it was, how we were measuring it who are the accounts, what are the types of marketing that we can do. And they weren't always delivering immediate results, but what they were delivering was immediate feedback. So the feedback we got from customers, the feedback I got from account executives, I have a document, you know, pages long, where I keep their quotes of where they saw the value because it may not have hit that dashboard yet on the dollar numbers, but it was starting to already hit the relationship and reputational goals we had, which was in turn going to help with the revenue. Got it. So it, it really needs to also be a large enough account for, for a marketer to be able to justify a two, three year campaign against that account, right? I mean, that, that size of success is, is, is pretty critical. Look, I say two to three years, not everyone. Like we revisit the accounts every, every 12 months. So we do relook at the accounts and make sure have we got, I mean, something like COVID happens. You couldn't have predicted that two to three years ago. So when I'm talking about the the two to three years or the size of the account, I do actually say to people when they're starting ABM to think big, start small, move fast. So we started with just a couple of accounts in our first few months, and then we were starting to prove the results of that and then actually moving quickly into how we could program, make it more programmatic and we could learn what was working with our accounts and then be able to roll that out. So What you do want to be looking at is which of those accounts that they may not necessarily always be the largest accounts. They might be the accounts that are really, you know, if you got them up on stage or if they were to be written up as a reference, which is the other part of my team looks after our customer marketing, are they going to be a real great alignment for your brand? 
are they going to really be seen as innovators? Are they really transforming? Are they aligned to your values? So sometimes it's not always the biggest accounts, but we've got some great accounts with Salesforce that have grown and and really changed the markets in which they're in. So they don't have to be large, but they have to be ready to transform is probably what I would say. And really the account team really willing to do something innovative and different. Got it. Makes sense. Talk about net new accounts and expansion, because I know expansion being kind of customer marketing is also a big part of what you do. How do you how do you approach these two differently? And you know what? Yeah, what what do you kind of think about when somebody says you know this is also an account that might be one to few or a one to one that is net new? We have not dealt with them. It's greenfield versus existing customer. We're looking at expansion. Yeah. So look, the first thing we do with all of our accounts, as I mentioned earlier, is the discovery phase. So the discovery phase is the same for a a net new account as an existing. I pretend that when we go in to read their account plans that we know nothing. So we read the account plan as to where it's at for that year. We get them to fill out a survey that includes a lot of questions about where do we currently sit with regard, are we Overall, does the account see us as, you know, are they advocates for Salesforce? Are they neutral? Are they detractors? You know, are they positive, negative, et cetera? Um, How many of the stakeholders are neutral, positive, negative? How many of, you know, who are the partners in the account? Like whether it's an implementation partner or a strategy consultant, who are the key C-suite that you want to learn more about? Who are the ones that are making the decision? So we ask a lot of different questions. We also ask that account how receptive that customer might be to certain different types of marketing. So we can look at what they've engaged in through obviously our CRM, but we also want to hear, you know, would they be interested in hearing some thought leadership through a third party that we could bring to them? Would they be coming to a third party webinar? Do they listen to podcasts? Do they ever mention this sort of thing? So we ask a lot of those questions. And then we have the 30-minute discovery call. And then also doing your decisioning trees and stakeholder mapping and all of that. But really early in our sales engagement, we try to deliver value through insights and, and all sorts of other different things, which, which I can get to um, when we talk about the, the sales team engagement. But really, a lot of the, probably the main difference between net new and existing accounts is the level by which we might engage and educate them around Salesforce. Particularly, I love to lean into our values. What are we doing in the local community? And how are we supporting, you know, local community initiatives that could also be supported by that particular prospect or customer? So actually really showing the proof of our values, bringing that to life locally is something that we might try and do more with a new customer, but also with existing. Also with new customers is Sometimes they may not have as um, may not want to attend a one hour webinar or a different event. They might want a short podcast to listen to, or they might want to actually hear from other customers and inviting them into forums where they can hear from other customers. Um, so they're not just hearing from Salesforce, but they can actually also form connections into the Salesforce community that we love to amplify is more about the whole community around Salesforce and other people that you can learn from. Got it. Got a lot more awareness within those accounts and of who Salesforce is. I love it. Before talking about sales engagement, there's one other thing that I want to ask you, and that goes three years ago when you started ABM at Salesforce and when you were looking at picking your accounts. Did you have a, uh, maybe let, let me rephrase this a little bit differently. A lot of organizations, when they're starting with ABM, the 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 thing that a marketer would be scared of is you know yes I want to do a pilot I want to do a small campaign but what if I pick the wrong accounts and then all of a sudden there's no you know I can't show the results or maybe I will pick too few accounts and you know the chances of one or two of them would work is is small and therefore you know that I, I can't I can't justify expanding the program did you have those concerns? Were those on, you know, on your on your list of things to worry about? And did you have like that that prioritization matrix as robust to feel strong enough to be like, you know what? Yeah, we're good. We're going to go based on this. Was that there or was it a little bit of guesswork? How did you kind of overcome that that challenge? Yeah, it was it was definitely there and we did only start with a small number of accounts. What I would say is for us Three months into the role, I actually dropped one of the accounts. 
I actually said to our CMO and to the vice president of that particular industry vertical that that account came from and to the account executive, I don't think it's the right time for account-based marketing in this account. However, what we all know is account-based marketing is not a replacement for other marketing programs and initiatives. It is It, it should complement other things that are happening. So they could still lean into executive engagement programs, industry marketing that were still recipients of, you know, seeing our brand across, you know, buses or tram shelters and things like that. They could still come to other events. They were just not going to be ready for the deeper account-based marketing. The account just wasn't ready. It wasn't in the right sort of industry for us to focus this sort of effort. And I felt we could end up investing a lot of time and effort in an account that was not necessarily going to be our best bet, okay, if we were have a small set of accounts. So I got a feel for that in the first few months. And in hindsight, it was the right decision. And even more so, it's it's come to fruition that that was the right decision back then. But they're still leaning into a lot of other marketing that is available. It just wasn't right for account-based marketing at that time. So, uh, you know, really don't feel like you have to be, my advice to others would be trust your instinct too. I mean, I did have the benefit of having done account-based marketing before. It wasn't my first, you know, six months, but also talk to those around you. And actually, if, if you're getting a gut feel, talk to other people that work in that account. We've got consultants, we've got architects, we've not just the salesperson who's going to say, hey, I need it, but talk to others who are also working in that account to understand if your concerns are, are valid or if they can help if you can work through them. So that would be my advice is that it's don't just hang on for, you know, to the death because, you know, you don't want to, to not follow through on, on something. But if it just doesn't feel right, start to talk to some other people. And in our case, it was the right decision. And we still had some success with the other accounts and have been able to grow the, you know, grow the program significantly because we were able to show success in other areas, but also that we were brave enough and bold enough to say, you know what, maybe it's not this account. Maybe we should look at another one. Got it. Okay. Let's talk sales engagement. Okay. Tell us a little bit about your approach working with the sales. We've already touched on some, but let's dig a little bit deeper. How do you kind of start your engagement with sales and how does that look like? Yeah, you know, I have a vivid memory of being in a meeting room in Melbourne. I'm actually based in Sydney, but early in my career, I think it was my first year as a marketing manager over 20 years ago and presenting a marketing plan to a group of salespeople for that particular product. And at the end, they basically said, how did you come up with it? You know, who of us did you speak to? And I hadn't spoken to a single one of them. I'd read all these market intelligence reports and, you know, really thought that I was going to be the expert as to what would be the right marketing for this particular product. But I hadn't spoken to a single person who was was out there selling. I had done telephone sales for that product before, but that is always on my mind. And so what I say is engage early and often with your sales team. So from the get-go of selecting the accounts, the sales vice presidents were involved. And then it was working directly with their sales team. And when I say often, for our one to few sales teams, we have a call with them every fortnight, taking them through all of the programs that are available for them to leverage, but also getting their feedback. And we always try and spotlight one of the salespeople's, one of their peers who is using an element of the program really well. It could be a peer-to-peer customer roundtable that that we've held that they've lent into. It could be how they're using a a particular piece of insights or an executive profile. It could be about how they're, you know, linking those up to actually have a great executive briefing meeting. So we we do try to um, feature, you know, have them engage with their peers as well. So, but when we engage early and often, as I said earlier, that discovery phase is really important, not just for us to get an understanding of the account. And we want to show them that we've read your account plan. We've, you know, we've read the survey. And then what we do is we want to actually pay it forward and deliver them something of value very early in that engagement. And when I say pay it forward, it might be an account insights report. So our agency, for example, helps us put together you know, a three-page account insights report that has everything of share price performance and in the news and intent data and who the top executives are and that that's something that we present to them that will help them in their account planning as they refine their account plans. We might also provide them with an exec profile really early on the top execs that they're really trying to 
to get relationships with or to, to grow and deepen their relationships. We do then, you know, not just engage early and often, we're listening, but we also deliver something back of value very soon. And also really understanding what are their goals and how can we align the account-based marketing goals accordingly. So then actually developing the three R's for that segment, if it's a one to few, or for that account and how that matches up to the sales goals as well. So really aligning the marketing with sales and business outcomes, not just with marketing activities. Also, we realize that, you know, our sales teams aren't necessarily messaging experts. So how we help them in developing really crisp messaging for their accounts that is going to help them go deeper with personalization in an RFP or in other things that they could use. So actually providing them with some elevator pitch type messaging as well. And then, you know, also with the sales teams, it's how we, we're also, because we cover the strategic accounts, we like to be the conductor of the marketing orchestra for them as well. So how they could leverage exec programs or industry, or we've got this happening. It may not be something we're leading from account-based marketing, but we know from the insights and the discussions we've had that this should, this might be something of interest to your account. You should actually get them along to, you know, Lisa's round table that she's running or that dinner, et cetera. So so yeah, we also we also do that as well to actually be their marketing partner. That's amazing. That's amazing. And I, and I, you know, one of the things that I've realized working with with on ABM campaigns is it's also really important for the sales team to understand how much work goes into to ABM campaign. You know, where when you kind of show them the tip of the iceberg, it's like, yep, yeah, cool. All right, this is just another thing that I have, and I'll take a I'll take a look at it. But when they when they actually see the whole of the iceberg, when they are just like you said, when they're involved in every stage of it, it's just like I know how much work has gone into this, and I'm now even more motivated. Now, forget about the fact that now my inputs are here, and you know you've taken that into consideration and mix it into into this this ABM program. But also, I've seen how, this the, how how hard this team has worked on it, and therefore. I'm a lot more likely to leverage it, leverage it and put a lot more effort. Have you seen something similar to that? Yeah, absolutely. They can see they're part of the formation of the different elements of personalization because, again, that is what makes sets account-based marketing apart. We've started with the needs of the account or the cluster of accounts, and then we've built everything out from there. We've built the messaging, we've built the activities, we've built a journey of what we want to take the customer on. And we've also then been saying to the sales team all along the way, what's a key moment that could be mattering to you? Like what's coming up where you might need additional help? Because the sales teams aren't used to engaging marketing this way. They're used to sometimes being receiving of all of the marketing programs that are available to them and they have to choose what is relevant for their account. This time we're trying to create it for them based on the fact that it's relevant for this set of accounts or for one particular account or one particular pursuit within an account. So when it happens that way, uh, they are they are more bought into it, absolutely. They also need to sometimes be reminded of, oh, you just mentioned that you're, and this used to happen in the pre-COVID times, that your customer's not able to come to our event because they're going to be in San Francisco. Why are they in San Francisco? Are we having a meeting with them while they're in San Francisco? And then they start to ask those questions. They also now realize the importance of even understanding more about the hobbies of their customer because we don't want to invite them to the AFL if they're a mad rugby fan, you know, or we know what team they go for. So we really want to get into that business to person, that human interaction, those human touches. And also, you know, to drive that reputation and relationship that other parts of marketing haven't necessarily been measured on or been able to do because they're not measured on them. So we were able to bring that element that the sales teams are not used to. So sometimes we're often reminding them if we could help you with that. So, you know, that's great as well. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. This is this has been amazing. Uh, I, I love this conversation. Now, before we wrap up, uh, and I have I have a few rapid questions I want to ask you, but before before I do that. Is there anything that you know you you think about our conversation is important that I maybe didn't ask, but you think that listeners are going to get a lot of value that that we didn't touch on? Hang in there. It's not easy. You can probably tell I'm a bit passionate about this. 
it is the most exciting area of marketing right now. And it is the area where you get closest to your customer. So if you're like me and you've been in sales, but you don't necessarily want to still be in sales and you want to be really close to the customer, then this is the, the most exciting place to be where you can see and hear and feel the impact that your marketing is having, not just on a business and with a business solution, but sometimes on the people themselves. You know, I was at a Dreamforce in 2019 where, you know, going into it, someone who was not quite sure about Salesforce going in ends up saying to me, have you always done this account-based marketing thing? And I said, no, not my entire career, but for about the last five years. And he said, because it's really amazing. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, I feel like you're not selling to me. I feel like you really care about me and you're trying to help me. And so that really had an impact on him. And I you know, I never told him I do, I guess it's on the bottom of my emails. I do account-based marketing and I, I was introduced more as sort of the person in marketing that can really help and, and steer them in the right direction. We did very curated agendas and experiences, you know, you know, during business hours at Dreamforce and after hours, we'd, we'd set up very specific meetings, very specific welcome packs, all sorts of things that we'd done for them. But to think that you can actually have an impact in someone's, you know, business decision that could also personally help their career. So yeah, that's I would say don't don't give up. Reach out to me. Happy to to talk to anyone and and to connect and and share stories. It is worth it, but it can take a bit of time. Got it. I love it. I love it. It is it is probably the most human form of marketing. Like you're closest to uh, to to that. But I, I love that description. Okay, let's let's do a couple of questions really quick and uh, before we wrap up. So the first thing I want to ask you is what's one resource could be a book um, podcast blog whatever it is that you consume that has changed the way you you work or live i would say it's a book and i've read several of these authors books but the one that probably changed me the most and that i related to and i try and live by is leaders eat last by simon sinek so I love, you know, that was helping me understand how I could become the leader that I wanted to become. It also explained a lot about the leaders that really inspired me and why, and also the ones that, you know, I learned from for the opposite reasons. But yeah, it was more about how, you know, focusing on the people and then the numbers will manage themselves, not managing the numbers first. Got it. Next question. What is one piece of advice that you would give to B2B marketers? What would that be? Invest time in collecting insights and data from a variety of internal and external sources. It could be quantitative data, qualitative data, looking at social media, you know, really using that data to inform your messaging and your programs to be more relevant to your audience. Relevance is just so important right now in a very crowded marketplace. So to be relevant, you know, really finding the data and insights that's going to, that's going to move the needle. Got it. Question number three: What are some of the who are some of the influencers that you kind of follow in the in this in this space? Well, definitely Bev Burgess from ITSMA. Actually, yes, I do have her book here. Oh, there so, we go. Uh, the second there we edition. go. I even I've even got a signed copy. Look, yeah. <laughs> So Bev is like a, not just an expert on account-based marketing, but just a lovely human. I, you know, am privileged to be able to chat to her every week at the moment. But, but yeah, definitely following Bev. Other from a marketing perspective, Seth Godin, but then business generally, you know, the Richard Branson, I love the, you know, when you put your employees first and you look after your employees, they'll take care of your customers. And, and Mark Benioff is like that as well. I've mentioned Simon Sinek local leaders, Naomi Simpson. So yeah, there's some of there's some of the people that I follow and um, really relate to. Got it. Okay. Last one. No, sorry. Third question is, no, this is the last one. Sorry. What's, what's something that excites you about B2B today? Well, I think it goes back to everything I've just mentioned. Personalization excites me, but being able to personalize at scale, having the technology, having the data and insights serving us up the ability to personalize at scale is what will excite me. So that account-based marketing won't just be something new. It will actually be expected that it's it's not, you know, a nice to have, it's a must have. And that we've got personalization at scale being able to happen so that it's not as resource intensive sometimes, but it's even more targeted and even more efficient. Got it. Well, 
on that note, Stephanie, this has been an awesome conversation. I really love it. Thank you so much for, for coming on the show. And I'm pretty sure a lot of our listeners are going to get, get a lot out of this. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. It's been great to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolute pleasure. Thanks so much for joining us on this episode. If you enjoyed it, please consider leaving us that five-star rating on Apple Podcasts and sharing the pod with a friend. If you'd like to continue the conversation, please make sure to join the community Slack channel at growthcolony.org forward slash Slack. growthcolony.org forward slash Slack. Thanks again for all the support. We're looking forward to seeing you again in the next one.